So um, I actually uh, will make a very short um, um, introduction um, and pass the word uh, the word immediately to Mr. Feuer. I just would like to say something from my perspective um, as a director of this um, marvelous institution. Um, I have been fascinated um, um, in this last uh, months discovering uh, the work um, of Edmund de Waal and reading um, some incredible um, I mean, I was I was um, reading the Lettre Camondo, and I was uh, uh, making a travel through time, and it was incredible language. I will get back to this, and I was very fascinated by uh, the work done by Desire Feuerle, putting together pieces, unseen pieces from the Feuerle collection, and um, these four marvelous installations. And I would like to pass the word asking. Desiree, why do we start here at the Feuerle Collection with this exhibition in the Silk Room? Okay, that's, that's, it's a good question. Um, you know, I had many, many ideas for years and I thought, you know, after the pandemic, I thought it's maybe the right moment to start, but with who? Um, Edmund de Waal is a person I watch since a while, since a long while, and I, uh, for me it's important to watch people. Because for me, my aim is in collecting also to, to do something with somebody who I can see is still there in 50 years. And I tell you, a lot of artists who have been successful and known, they suddenly disappeared. And uh, of course you can never know, but I think, I know, you could think, you know, <laughs> it's a crazy person when I say that, but I really think you can, when you really try to feel the art. And uh, his work is really, is, is so sensitive, and he really transpasses something what you rarely see in art. There are not many artists like this, I tell you. And even you go back in history, there have been only very few who have this sensitivity, but on the other hand, he is very strong. And so for that reason, I thought, and I had a complete different idea, I wanted to show other, juxtapose other European masterpieces, maybe I do it one day, so that I cannot tell you what it was, masterpieces, gifts, you know, royal gifts to royal other houses, and uh, finally, I changed to something, what you see here, which are vessels from the 6th century, from Boma, from the Mon Kingdom, a very important kingdom at its time. Uh, more known, in fact, in the whole world uh, for their sculpture, but especially these bronzes, they have this an, a ritual character, and that's what they have been for sure used for, uh, transpass something magic. And I find this magic also in the work of, of Edmund. He is really, he, he is strong and bringing really our culture, I think it's very European. He, he feels very European in a very beautiful but complete open way. And then he, it's a melange of, of uh, his soul, I think he melts uh, here, especially when I put it together with this vessel, which was uh, it was a, a palanquin chair a box, uh, what the Chinese emperor used to carry pieces inside. So uh, for me, it's interesting. Also, his vessels, they are full of beautiful idea on our culture but completely open, as he is a very open person. And that is not so normal. <laughs> For that reason, I think, we had, I had to do something like this, and I'm very happy I started. And something else it has to be minimal. For me, you know, you see, we could have filled it up with much more pieces. Like, the whole museum could be filled up with much more pieces. But I think it's important to celebrate and bring the soul of a piece out and that is only possible when you show less and let also the eye rest and 
seeing maybe the silk curtains or the ceiling and going then to the next. Okay, now I pass you <laughs> the speaker. Well, that was embarrassing. <laughs> and wonderful and generous and generative because it is absolutely extraordinary to be here this afternoon in this amazing collection. This ex it's sui generis, it's unique. It's unique in so many ways. It's unique in its understanding of sacred art. Um, it's un unique in its um, understanding of how we might approach art, how much space we need, how much um, light we need, how much time, crucially, we need to see something. That extraordinary presence as you come down in that lift uh, or down the stairs into that first space and, and, and into darkness uh, and there's the, um, the music is played, those extraordinary, extraordinary music is played and, and you come out into this series of encounters um, with remarkable art and you feel like your whole body has been um, reset um, that your you know your diaphragm is slightly different your breathing is slightly slower and and um, and your eye begins to adjust you begin to sense where objects might be the relationship between them the shadows between them the sacred text for this whole amazing place is in praise of shadows by Tanizaki, the great Japanese novelist, that wonderful book where he says that actually it's not about light, it's about, it's about shadows, it's, that's what really matters. So that's my first thing. <laughs> and the second thing is then I get an email from Desiree and, and, and um, saying it's going to happen. <laughs> It's going to happen in, in no time at all. <laughs> We're going to do this thing in September. This year, not next year, not next decade. It's, I've, I've, I've decided. It's a very desiree um, uh, beginning of any email. And, 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 and then the question is what to bring together for, for, for this space. Recent work to bring into connection to this unseen, this unbelievable... So it's very interesting, and I let Desiree have a completely free hand, didn't I? Absolutely. I didn't say... Which I appreciated a lot. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I, so, hubristic artist, you know, what do you say? You, this is a great honour to be here, an excitement to be so near this extraordinary collection. But actually, it's about trust. It's about saying, actually, no, I'd be really intrigued, really, really intrigued about what you choose because I want to find out what you want to find, what you want to choose out of my current work, the work that I've been making in these last two years. All this is from the last two years. It's, it's, it's absolutely, it's me now, <laughs> here. And you chose these pieces. And I'm really intrigued by what you chose. I'm going to hand this back, but honestly, I'm so thrilled. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I mean, it's, uh, you know, uh, when you ask me why I choose these pieces, um, let's say the, the, the piece at the very end, on the very far end, on the very far end yeah. is uh, a, a, a small piece, but you know, in general, I like small pieces. Mm. Um, and it has something which uh, I just told you before, you know, it has something I have seen in Rembrandt. When you are looking in inside the Rembrandt, I try always to look inside of pieces. And then sometimes, that's the interesting thing, we really feel um, something similar. And this started, in fact, mm. when I was very, very young. I went with my parents to Sofrescos of Giotto mm. in Italy. And uh, later on, I went, uh, I think, uh, just half a year later, I saw beautiful works by Yves Klein. 
And I thought it's very interesting to have something in common, these two pieces. Beauty and feeling and inner, something inner who moved me in both. And I put them in postcards at that time together yeah. and had it on the wall. And this was also the beginning, you know, for me to really experiment. And when I see these works here, they, you know, you, you bring, I don't know, they have something absolute timeless, or at the same time they deal with, um, um, let's say Morandi, but Morandi, because it was mentioned before, Morandi for me has not the same openness and not the same extraordinary beauty. Um, he you does. have really extraordinary... He, for, for, for he does. Yes. I, can't, I can't hear a word against yeah. Morandi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, okay. No, okay. No, no, not one word. Yeah. But you bring it in another level. Yeah. Okay. And sometimes I think <laughs> you... Yeah, no, let me think of yeah. You bring it in another level, yeah. you know, and I really think uh, Morandi, yeah, Morandi at its time, but nobody could say, oh, he's working like Morandi. No, he's, uh, he's like Morandi would be a sculpture. You're different. And you bring different aspects. Yeah. Now I'm going to grab the microphone yeah. off you. <laughs> so, so, okay, so lots of things there, my friend. What, 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 one of which is, is the thing that I find most moving about Morandi is something I find actually in, in other parts of your collection here, which is um, the return to something. So Morandi spends 50 years in that Bologna apartment with that series of objects, that series of vessels, very simple, quotidian, daily vessels, rearranging them just a little bit, nudging them here, nudging them there, in that dusty apartment, and looking at them and looking how, how light, how light falls on them. And in doing so, what he's trying to do is to understand the presence of objects, the, 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 the meaning that objects have. The, not the representation of objects, but the meaning that they have. The meaning that vessels have. Vessels are very I was just saying, just this minute ago, um, Sarah, that the vessels are very, very close to human beings. When we see a vessel, and we, we're, we're also seeing a, a, a person. We're seeing a, a, an interior space. We're seeing a breath like a human being. So when we see Mirandi, what we're seeing is someone who's paying deep time, is in deep time thinking about objects. And, and, and I suppose for me, what's wonderful about this collection, and I suppose it's what I also have been trying to do, I'm very old, I'm, I've been doing this for 50 years, I'm, I've been making pots since I was a child, is what, what I'm trying to do with my vessels is to slow, slow the world down. You know, just slow it down. Slow in that vitrine at the back, just a very few things in darkness and shadow, a few glints of gold. In these other golden vitrines, just a few objects, a piece of alabaster. You love materials, you know, you're passionate, you understand why this matters. <laughs> and for that reason, I have to say, yeah, you, to you push it, you, you push the beauty, which yeah. I of course see. I yeah. love Morandi. Yeah. Yeah. But you push it further. Mm -hmm. You push it further. You bring it in our time. And in our time, which is not so beautiful, it is especially beautiful that somebody like you is doing this, pushing it further and bringing a beauty out, with a, a magic beauty. And it's more, you piece are magic also. They have something magic. And this, the real magic, I do not see in a Morandi. That's maybe more your quality. <laughs> and this is something why these pieces are different so, to me. So many of the people, uh, thank you, yeah. by the way. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's so interesting for me because so much of the art in this incredible collection is sacred art. You know, it's ritual art. I mean, here we are with this incredible suite. I can't, I shouldn't be turning my back on these objects. It's, 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 it's bad manners. <laughs> to turn my back on these incredible objects, these unseen pieces from your collection. So when we think about the art that endures, 
which is a real question and it's a lovely interesting question to ask and isn't asked at all in our culture what endures why does it endure what is it about objects that have been made for a sacral purpose for a sacred purpose for a ritual purpose that makes them so special what, what why do they endure and it's something there's something about time it's something about making something <laughs> not for one particular moment but for something repeated to be handed on to reflect back to be in the present but to be f so it's it's all about tenses it's and all about tenses you can have the microphone here it comes no <laughs> you know and you said you know to hand it on i like yeah, that yeah, good but you know most art today many of the art today i would say is not made to hand it on of course it isn't it's and this is my criticism mm. this is why i really look for pieces which i think will be there forever maybe they're a bit forgotten this can happen you know in in, in center these have been forgotten but they're never forever forgotten then they come back and are celebrated again and i really think this is to me uh, really important to support that you know to support the thinking not only it is lifestyle it's cool it's the moment yes it's also an aspect but i always think you know it, great achievements in life they did not just come like that you know they, it's a, a, it's a hard work and really a, a, a deep insight which is captured them in a piece and when you see these things also you know it was not done to do art mm -hmm. but somebody who gave everything his talent mm -hmm. also inside and for sure it was a gifted person because mm -hmm. you know it's uh, you feel it you feel it you know it's something which moves us today done in the sixth century and it moves us today done you know not everybody moves us today which is done in the sixth century also no. not at all no. and that's interesting i think yeah just because it's old yeah. and special yeah, no, yeah. that's yeah. important so, yeah, sorry yeah. it's a really important line to say just because it's old it isn't special said again um but what's ex but 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 there is something um profound about well, can we talk about memorial? Because a lot of the pieces in the collection and, and, and a lot of the work that I've been doing, actually also in this group that you've brought together, uh, is about memorial. It's about remembering something or remembering someone. Can I, can I elaborate? All the way back behind you, you can't see it, is a piece in far distance which is just a piece of marble, a uh, flat marble, a piece of alabaster, beautiful translucent alabaster, and a single, a single leaning piece of golden porcelain. It's porcelain, incredibly thin. If it was not gold, it would be translucent. The light would come through it. And on that golden tile is the uh, family seal the family crest of the Camondo family in Paris um, and you mentioned I wrote a book of letters to the Camondo family and um, it's they were cousin Jewish cousins of mine in Paris and the museum there it, the Musée Camondo in the Rue de Monceau is is full of their collection and the story of them is is incredibly moving they, they created the collection of amazing 18th century art, and they were deported. They gave the collection to France, and they were deported, and they were murdered in Auschwitz. And I made a book of letters for the family, and I made a, 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 an exhibition in that space, in the Musée Camondo, which just finished earlier in the summer. So how on earth do you make an exhibition in a family house with that history? How, how, how can you possibly do it? You have to do something incredibly quiet, incredibly quiet. You have to barely be there. Now this is important, you have to barely be there. So what I did was to make things and put them in drawers in the, in, in, in the secretaire, in the, in the, in, in put things in cupboards 
And then high up in one of the, the, the attic spaces of this beautiful house, there was this single piece with a window behind it. And it just was there for a year, just catching the light. And people could, a few people could go and see it. It was hidden away. And now it's gone from Paris, it's come to here. It's a memorial. But all it is, is three materials, marble, alabaster, and a piece of porcelain. But that kind of simplicity, that kind of pairing back, um, is something that I think you find in early, early sculpture. This idea that you take everything back and make something of great simplicity, and then it holds the idea, it holds the presence, because that's what a memorial is. It, nothing complicated, nothing baroque. It has to be unbelievably simple to actually be effective. So that is a memorial piece, and it's only so big. It's as big as a newspaper. That was Beautiful. Quite, that was no, no, question. no, that was just... Me. Beautiful, but no, 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 no. But, but beautiful. It, it's beautiful how you express it because you know I, um, I have chosen also this place mm. on this side mm. because um, I thought it's very, it's a very vulnerable, a very sensitive piece, mm. and I thought I, will, I want to give uh, importance to it, and I like very much to have the background of the the black right. silk. I have to say. Mm. And uh, yeah, it's it's it, it's beautiful. It's uh, it, it's something I think because it's so minimal, mm. it is so special because it transpasses this this simplicity of beautiful materials. But you choose also, you know, to, to put this little gold leaf, let's say, mm. the porcelain gold leaf, uh, makes it makes it really special to me. You know, this is this little thing. The, the, yeah. I, I would love Beautiful. to hear you talk about your vision. Sorry, I've got a loud voice. You can hear me. Um, I'd love you to talk about the black silk because I think it's absolutely extraordinary. This this idea in this. So here we are in a a bunker, <laughs> concrete, uh, water down below. What is it? This floor? No. I can't no, remember. Down, down. Down. I, I, I don't know where I am anymore. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, and then suddenly we have this, ex this, these, these beautiful, ethereal, black silk curtains, a different material coming in. Why? For me, it was important to respect this whole room, because I think it's a very attractive space to use for art. But I thought one day, so for that uh, reason, for example, we have to separate a separate building built outside where the offices are, not to cut anything away here. And I thought the ideal thing would be to have later, when it's needed, the possibility to create a room with silk. But it has to be the right silk. And Jim Thompson silk yeah. is really the, the the silk, which is ideal for it, because it, it's uh, you know it, it has this quality also, which you you feel it's a noble material. A noble silk is a beautiful material, especially when it's hand woven. You feel this difference of great quality, but in everything in life, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, to create in the big space a more intimate space. But anyway, a place which separates and allows you to do a separate exhibition which is still not a strange piece in the whole. Uh, this was important to me. And for that reason, I thought also that it's beautiful. Look, look at this stalagmites, for example. The ceiling, yeah. and then the floor, and then having this beautiful material. Already this, I think, is beautiful. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, it's, it's great for, for art when you install it the right way. I mean, I think in general you have to use materials or install things the right way and give the right light. Yeah. That's key, of yeah. course. But for that, I thought it's an ideal thing to use silk yeah. 
viable or you know no silk you can take it in and out easy but even so it's really solid mm. and anyway has this smoothness without saying I, 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 I love that and I, I, I'm hoping in our conversation we can talk about places that matter to us and of course uh, for me it's Japan <laughs> and I love I, Japan so I just have to say um, that I ran away from school when I was 17 to Japan to become a potter now I have children I'm appalled absolutely appalled that my parents allowed me to run away from Japan but I did I ran away from school to become a potter in Japan and you know and I ended up I was in pottery villages and in Kyoto I had an introduction to a very old abbot in a beautiful Zen temple. So I was 17 and, you know, very long hair and jeans and it's this 1980. <laughs> and I, 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 and I have very little Japanese and I go to see him and, and I, you know, I take off my shoes, all that stuff. I, I do the ritual tsukubai with the water my hands taking the water in uh, and then along a long corridor with a monk beautiful beautiful you can imagine the wood of the corridor up onto a tatami mat and then the extraordinary thing and this is what I was thinking when I came in just now an hour ago is I came into a room and an unseen person opened a screen and I walked through into another room and then another monk opened another door another wall disappeared and I went through another room three rooms into a small room the screen is closed the abbot comes in uh, and sits and we talk and we have tea together and it was this extraordinary sequence of movements from one material and one room to another. Now, it's very rare in the West, it's very, very rare in the West that you can move through one space into another space into another space. And actually, you know this, you're director of this music collection, you know, and actually feel that sequence of different spatial awareness as you move through. So I kind of feel coming into the silk room you know, I didn't find a Zen monk. Well, I found you. <laughs> but I, you know, but there's that feeling of sequence and the feeling of quietening down from one space to another, which is really special, which is why I think in the coming years you're going to really enjoy curating this. Um, so for me, Japan is foundational. It's where I begin. So where was the first... What's, tell me about you and falling in love with... The Orient, the East. Uh, good question. I mean, I, I fall in in love always with, with many things. I'm a passion person, and um, you know, I mentioned before Giotto. I like Italy very much. I saw, you know, when I went first time to Venice. Of course, like everybody or most people, you fall in love with. But going to Asia going very early to China uh, opened me something um, I was very impressed. It, at that time, you know, when my parents took me, China was very different. It was full of bikes. You know, I remember we had a car and it was a real privilege to have a car. Uh, we, we never had to stop on a traffic light, but hundreds or thousands of bike, uh, bikes had to stop. So, you know, th these are impressions you keep. And then something else. I felt in China, uh, everything is really very brain structured. Uh, from philosophy to art. When you compare it with Southeast Asian sculpture, everything is out of the stomach. And there is everything starting with the brain. Mm. Also the friends I have. Mm. It starts always with the brain, everything, which is very interesting. And I could feel this there first time. Also, I remember I was in Beijing. We arrived in the hotel. I went outside the hotel just to, to look a bit, to get the feeling of China. 
And suddenly I had, I had several people to ask me, where you're from? And I said, well, you know, from Germany. And then uh, I had suddenly 30, 40 people around me. And they asked me questions. They said, what, have you read this from Schiller? Yeah. Yes. Uh, what does Schiller mean? Yeah. Can you tell yeah. me? <laughs> and I was yeah. deeply impressed, yeah. you know? Yeah. I was deeply impressed. They asked yeah. me questions. I was really impressed. Yeah. Yeah. And this is something, you know? Mm. I, I just I thought, what an interesting country, yeah. you know? So you need always these inputs. And then I went into and studied it more, looked in museums later, you know? You get this interest. Then at the same time, very short later, I went to Thailand. And I, in, in Thailand, I felt this, this smoothness uh, of, of sculpture, of you know, the softness of people, very different to China. Mm. Uh, uh, out of the stomach, the, the, uh, you know, how, how is, I, I say it like that, you know? Kind of, you, you, you feel it deeply. And you feel also when you see the sculptures here, uh, they are very different to Chinese countries. Yeah. And I love really both. One is also very, you know, it's more based on, on, uh, on, 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 on minimal tradition of Zen, and the other is, uh, is more Baroque or yeah. whatever you call it. And then Japan was yeah. the other thing. Japan, I liked the discipline of mm. Japan and the aesthetic of Japan. You go to a simple place, the most simple, cheap place to order some noodles where workers go in. It is so sophisticated that you hardly find it somewhere else in the world. So these aesthetics, and they are really, and they appreciate the appreciation of quality of fruits, mm. of quality of food. And this goes then also in other things, you know? And yeah. I think yeah. this nurtured me. Mm. All this, I thought, this I don't find in Europe. Yes. This is an extra, yeah. uh, it attracts me. Um, that makes so much sense. And I, I actually, I suppose, actually being in this particular space, actually, I just want to reflect on something, which is the treatment of the building that you've had here. The allowing of, of, of the marks of age, um, the water, um, the, the, the brokenness of bits of concrete, um, all of this is profoundly um, wabi-sabi. This is completely a kind of aesthetic um, that would be understood in, in Japanese, in ancient Japanese aesthetics. You know, and, and, and in my own work, you know, that's been so important to me, that understanding that actually materiality is more beautiful if you look at if you look at how things have aged um, or, or moved. I mean, and it's so extraordinary, this. Um, and so when you look at my own vessels, they're not perfect vessels. You know, they're not that pure mycin object sitting still, shirt and tie, perfect. They, they, they are vessels of porcelain that, that move. They've moved in my hands. They've moved with my body. We use the word stomach. I like that a lot. And, and then moved in the kiln too. And so they have that kind of quality. But just, just here, just I, I don't know how much time we have, but just one simple anecdote, which is um, just the death only a month ago of Issey Miyake, who I knew. And the last time I saw him in, in Japan, um, I went for lunch with him, and he was wearing an old fisherman's jacket that had been darned. Is that, what's the German word for that? Stoffed. Mm -hmm. Had been mended um, again and again and again, just beautifully, but very visibly. Um, we sat and we had a meal um, just of very simple Japanese food, noodles, mm -hmm. <laughs> bit of raw fish, out of very beautiful bowls. But actually, the experience there of, of of, of seeing what he was wearing, which was the equivalent, I have to say, of this building, of something that had been gone through life, had gone through history, and was being taken care of um, with, it, with, 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 with passion, and struck me as really beautiful. And that is an aesthetic that I absolutely value to the ends of my fingertips. I want to add that I, there is also in Japan what you can learn or what you feel the whole time, the respect yeah. 
respect of tradition, respect of, ta respect of you, of the person. Uh, this respect, I think, also in materials and high achievements, uh, in food or choosing, you know, less is more, also in, 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 in quality choosing, uh, I think this forms the people and you feel it, you know, it's very interesting also, you know, sometimes these aspects of, of how somebody lives, goes through life, what he eats, it's very interesting, it forms a culture also. So if we're going to talk about culture, can I point out um, that the three other, the non-Paris work that you've chosen are from this series of works that I've made this year, which are called Elegies. And because you are an unbelievably educated, literate lot of people, you will realize that this is a hundred years this year that uh, Rilke's Duino Elegies were published. Lots of people nodding away here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I have to tell you a story. We've got, how many minute, more minutes have we got? Yeah, please take your okay, time. okay. So some of you will know my family's story, which was, is, it comes from Vienna, and that my grandmother, Elizabeth, uh, uh, the family were in Vienna and she was a poet in Vienna and she was a friend of Rilke and she sent her poetry to him and he criticized it and wrote that and sent her poems and they corresponded they had a beautiful correspondence of letters backwards and forwards over over many years and in 1922 he wrote to, to her to say I have just finished this suite of elegies, and here they are. And he sent her both some of the sonnets to Orpheus, beautiful, beautiful poems, and he sent her the last Duino elegy, a manuscript. Imagine being a young woman arriving with that envelope. Uh, and, 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 and so these are the poems that have been in my life. I remember my grandmother talking about these. And so this year, I've been working away on this series of elegies. And these pieces are me thinking about elegy, about what el elegy means, and thinking about Rilke, thinking about my grandmother, thinking about that history, that lost history of culture. Um, so we're talking about Japan, but I'm also European. I read in European poetry. I'm know my way around Berlin, and I read Rilke too. And so we have elegies here in the building. And it's interesting for me because the elegy is a very interesting thing. It's a, it's a way of, it's not sentimental. An elegy isn't sentimental. It's not nostalgic. It's got nothing to do, with, nostalgia is horrible. It's sentimental and, and cloying. It's, slugs are, it's, it's kind of whipped, cr you know, <laughs> it's all that stuff. It, it's nothing to do with it. Elegy is very pure. It's very pure. It's often broken. And so actually, I didn't know you were going to choose these pieces, but to have elegies here is really moving for me because there's broken sculpture here, which is pure elegy. You've got the extraordinary Chinese um, hand, um, stool, seat, seat for the emperor, where he sat and thought about the, the heavens and the earth, and that's elegy. So these are my elegies, and you have elegies in the building, and that's damn cool. Thank you. Thank you. So I think this is the most beautiful artist talk I've been ever attending <laughs> and you did all the work uh, and this is because the chemistry between you is incredible and I, I, I can feel it. So most of the questions I had in my mind just ca came out like in a, in a river <laughs> and, uh, and you can see it in this exhibition. It's, uh, it's an incredible chemistry between the two of you and uh, it's very beautiful to see this with our eyes and 
thank you Desire, thank you Sara, uh, thank you for um, being uh, the founders of the incredible place in Berlin and thank you to all the team of the Feuerle Collection for helping us doing this and thank you for being here celebrating the beginning of the first temporary exhibition of the Feuerle Collection in the Silk Room. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs>